Welcome, foolish mortals, to a podcast about the Haunted Mansion. You're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. Hey there, thanks so much for joining me here on the Tomorrow Society podcast, episode 36. I'm your host, Dan Heaton. And when you think about the classic Disney attractions, I'm not just talking about the ones that are okay or kind of popular, I'm talking about the transcendent attractions that have been part of the parks since pretty far into the early days, that have their own segment of fans that is almost apart from your typical Disney fans. Attractions that have backstories and false legends and have so many things going on with their histories that people can write books about these attractions, long books. They can do entire websites just looking into all the different theories and stories and Imagineers involved. That list gets pretty short. Now, granted, almost anyone could dive really far into any Disney attraction, but the ones that really stand out that are signature Disney attractions, I cannot think of too many that would fit this description better than the Haunted Mansion. It's an attraction that I enjoyed as a kid. I was a little scared, never totally freaked out, but... I enjoy more now because of all the layers to it. There's things that as a kid you sense, but you don't totally get. The level of creativity in these special effects, which go back to old theatrical tricks from the 19th century, the artistry on display from some of the best Disney Imagineers and creative minds they had. All of that was thrown together into a blender, and what came out was something that you couldn't even imagine could exist. There's contradictions, there's fun, there's scares. It's a brilliant attraction. And for that reason, I wanted to talk to my guest today, who is Jeff Bam, who was the founder of DoomBuggies.com. He's written a book on the Haunted Mansion. He's done so much. Very few people know that much about the attraction and were just enjoyable to talk to because, you know, I've read his book, I know about the attraction, but the amount I know is very small compared to Jeff, and it was a blast to talk to him. So let's get to my conversation. Here it is. Here's my chat with Jeff Bam. All right. Well, my guest today is Jeff Bam. He is the creator of DoomBuggies.com, the author of the book, The Unauthorized Story of Walt Disney's Haunted Mansion, and it's now in its second edition. Jeff's also a co-host of the Mousestalgia podcast, which focuses on Disneyland. Jeff, thanks so much for doing the podcast. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, great. So before we dive into the Haunted Mansion, as I have lots of questions there, um, I'm curious to know way back, how did you get interested in in Disneyland or in theme parks in general? Good question. My my folks grew up in LA. Um, they're they're natives to Los Angeles, and so they Disneyland was kind of their their place. They they went on dates there in the the uh, I guess in the late fifties, early sixties. When they had children, we they moved up to the Bay Area. I'm from the Bay Area, but they still had friends down there in Los Angeles. So we grew up kind of annually going down there and they would just drop the you know they had kids about the same age as their friends and so you know how that goes you know we would they would drop all of us kids off at disneyland for the day and they would go do their thing for the day and so i i kind of grew up going there on a regular basis uh you know so that's kind of how i got kind of initiated into the the mouse club you know and i i also am a very um 
I, I have also kind of loved monster stuff. I've been a monster kid all my life. Grew up in the early 70s, um, you know, and so I was a big fan of those monster magazines and all that kind of thing. And so I had that Haunted Mansion record that came out in 1969. I had multiple copies of that, and um, that made a big impact on me, too. So, And my parents were, Dis- you know, Disney people. We had Disney records everywhere. So uh, I think that kind of is the the foundation yeah no that makes sense i had a record when i was a kid i don't know if it's the same one i grew up in the early 80s that was like two kids go to the haunted mansion and but it was always a little weird it never really seemed to connect that well to the attraction it was like sort of the same but different but i don't i'm not familiar enough to know if that was the same one or if this was some sort of later iteration or something similar yeah uh well the story uh, of the you know there was there was the one that came out to tie in with the haunted mansion and that it was two kids it was mike and karen going on a date and they get they kind of get out of the rain they escape into this haunted house but it it's pretty that album is pretty close to what the attraction is it kind of walks you scene by scene through the attraction um, it's ron ron howard actually when he was before he was uh in, in happy days he took this this role of this kid on this record and so um that's kind of the famous record there's also a little a, a children's version where they kind of tell the story that's um you know one of those smaller seven inch read read here c records so yeah they had a couple of records about but those were really the two haunted mansion records that disney put out so i'm not i'm not sure if one of those is what you're talking about or not um, it, it probably is you know my <laughs> my knowledge of um memory of it i know we used to listen because it's a similar thing with, with my parents we had a lot of the, the records as a kid so it sounds familiar so did that when you went to disneyland was immediately was that the place you wanted to go was the haunted mansion or i I mean, I'm sure there were other places too, but were you drawn to that attraction as a kid too? You know, I don't know. I actually, I was kind of a timid kid. I was a little bit scared of the Haunted Mansion. I don't remember when that switched. I, I remember being a timid kid, but I also have always remembered going on the Haunted Mansion. I, I just know factually there was a, a point in time when I finally decided I'll do this. It was after the record. I mean, I grew up with that record. I, I loved the record because of the artwork in it. It was just this fascinating, you know, record with all these great pictures of ghosts and you know, ghouls and things. And I would trace the pictures and I just absolutely loved the record. But I that probably also kind of intimidated me from the real life version. I probably thought, I'm not sure if I really want to run into all these things in <laughs> reality. Uh, you know, but I also didn't go on Space Mountain right away. I just was not a thrill-seeking kid it was probably i don't know i was probably 10 or 11 before i decided to really try out the haunted mansion and space mountain and all those things um so uh, yeah it's a, but disneyland in general i just loved that that place um adventures through inner space actually was one of my my very favorite things as long as i can remember and the people mover i just you know i was just enthralled by the creativity well as a little kid not the creativity but just the you know, immersive, amazing place that it was. And, uh, and the haunted, haunted mansion record was more the, the monster kid side of me that just liked these, these movies and magazines and trading cards, but I didn't really want to live it for a while. Yeah. No, that makes sense because I, I grew up, I grew up in Missouri. So we only went one time when I was a kid to Disneyland, we went a lot to Disney world, but I'm jealous that you were so close there. We did go once though, right before, and I didn't know it at the time. Cause I was only nine, but like an eight, right before adventure through inner space closed. And that has really stuck with me because we were a little freaked out by it. Like basically you're in the queue and you see this like fake image of these people, like getting shrunk and going by and you're just like, Oh my gosh, what, what's going to happen? <laughs> So that yeah. that stuck with me more than most things from that trip. So I don't know something about that attraction. I can see why that would that would draw you in. Though it's too bad that you know. Well, obviously that's gone, but the People Mover's gone. The Tomorrowland there is Space Mountain's great, but it it needs some help. Yeah, it needs needs some attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what about um? So the Haunted Mansion. I know later on you obviously created like twenty years ago created Doombuggies dot com and everything. When did you really get dive in kind of to the fandom side of being so into Disneyland and the Haunted Mansion in particular? Yeah, that started with my interest in WED yeah, or Imagineering, I guess. So when they started opening Disney stores, uh, that was I guess the mid late eighties. Um, they opened a couple of them in the Bay Area, and um, that place just, it kind of cemented. So I'd always had this, like I was talking about, this interest in the place as a kind of an, a, a 
place that attracted me to visit and be surrounded, you know, in the surroundings. But but when the Disney store opened and all of a sudden there was this one place where you could see concept art and all the books, you know, lots of the Disney um, artwork kind of focused in one place, that kind of trip to switch for me where I really started to realize, hey, all these things I kind of like kind of kind of have one thing in common and they were it was the design process and the imagineers that put it all together so that's kind of how i became drawn into the whole idea of disney fandom and i remember one time i went to a disney store you know early 80s and there was a an imagineer there who had just got his his just got hired at imagineering and he was talking to the the cast member who worked in the store and i was just kind of eavesdropping in this I mean, he couldn't have been more than early 20s, but this kid was just, you know, so excited about his new job at Imaginary. I don't even know who it was. Who knows? You know, <laughs> who could be someone amazingly famous now. But and I just remember thinking, wow, you know, that's such a great job. And so I'm so intrigued by what these people do. And that kind of started my interest. You know, and I followed some pretty standard pathways in the 80s. I was a fan of the, you know, I would read the e-ticket magazine and kind of followed the National Fantasy Fan Club events. I didn't go to many of them because I was a little too young to really get myself to Southern California. Back then, I was busy, you know, working part-time and going to college. But, you know, I started to read all the books and kind of soak in the information. And that's kind of when the just appreciating the parks turned more into my, my fandom. And then also about the early 90s is when Usenet started to become a thing early mid 90s and so then i found all the news groups with all the disney fans and so that kind of was the final i guess the 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 final thing that really turned me into a card carrying disney nerd (laughs) well and that was that was early on too think of you know if you were a little later the way the internet was it might have even been crazier but still that that was a fun time i was a little too young like i was getting into college kind of when you know like 94 95 when like but when we got an email address and it was the most amazing thing but i still feel like i was a little behind the curve through much of it you know but yeah it's interesting how you came you kind of came into the at just the right time did you ever think about wanting to be i mean i'm sure you thought about it did you ever pursue it all being an imagineer or going in that direction you know i i didn't and it's interesting why you know at that time i didn't really feel like i had a an understanding of what an imagineer is you know i thought more like well they design these theme park rides and it must be something that i i can't do you know and it turns out now as an imagineering fan you know i kind of realized well what imagineering is is a big collection of people that do whatever they do really well so that they have all these disciplines and i'm a graphic designer graphic artist and i went to art school which kind of which probably may have been a pursuit that could have translated towards imaginary but i just never i was more of a fan at the time when i was kind of pursuing a career i knew that i was very talented as a graphic designer and i just never really considered not just pursuing that wherever it it took me uh so i didn't really look at disney as a i just looked at it more as something to admire and i i guess i never have really taken it extremely i've never said well maybe i I've never had regrets, let's put it that way, that I, you know, I should have gone back and looked into being an Imagineer. And especially these days, I mean, Imagineering's had its ups and downs, and it's hard to find a longtime Imagineer that doesn't have some stories of, man, I almost got out of there, or, you know, it's, 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 it's a job like any other job with its struggles and its triumphs and so you know i i'm i'm happy being a fan <laughs> no that make that makes sense because you know now especially from what i've heard i mean i'm no expert either i never really pursued it but it's more it's so based on project by project by project and a lot of them if, i mean yes there you have your tony baxter and whatnot and even he has stories i know from what i've heard but it's so i think they get laid off and re-added and it's a tough it's a tough business i mean yeah. like any job yeah. so like you said yeah. so I don't think you made a bad decision there, but you did create <laughs> doombuggies.com, which, you know, has lived on. It's one of those sites that, you know, when I was diving into really my fandom, especially after college, so we're talking late 90s, early 2000s, it was one of those sites that just like, how does this exist? Like, how who was, do, who was behind this? And at the time, I had no idea who was behind anything. But it would, that was really impressive for me to kind of get back into Disney as an adult. So what made you decide to really go from those Usenet groups and just kind of expand it from there? Yeah. Well, to be honest, it was a a few things. One of the things was a practical thing. I graduated from San Jose State in, I don't know, maybe 90, what was it, 90? 
92, 93. It was just before you needed to take computer classes in the design program. So I had this great, you know, graphic design degree, but with no, absolutely no online type of design training or understanding, right? And I knew, boy, I really have to know also about these these web page things that are happening, you know, <laughs> if I'm going to be a, a successful designer, you know, so I so I kind of wanted to teach myself website design, the HTML. So that's part of it was I was trying to find a, something that I could do, you know, people were putting together their fan tributes to their pets and bands on GeoCities and that kind of thing. So I just thought, well, what do I do? I have all this information about, you know, Imagineering and I'd collected articles and photos and magazine things and, you know, all the interests I'd had over the years. And I thought, well, I can, you know, I have a good, decent little Haunted Mansion collection of media. Maybe I can just put together this kind of fan tribute site, except to the Haunted Mansion instead of to a rock and roll band. And that's what I did in 1997. You know, it kind of took off from there. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure things have changed so much with how the internet is, but you were definitely on the kind of front end of, like you mentioned, of fan sites, especially on the Disney side, where you're well before even podcasts and things appeared in the mid-2000s, and where things really, you know, web forums and such were taking off. You know, you kind of saw it evolve with the site. I mean, how much did you, you know, did you, I know you made a lot of adjustments, but how did it evolve as you went along? Mostly in content. So, so Doom Boogies, if you visit today, it's a good five years since I've done any design up to, I mean, the content I, I update once in a while, but I'm in the midst of trying to bring it into, you know, the modern world. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's a, it's a nice vintage website right now um so there's there's content but it's you know it's it needs to be modernized so but up through i would say you know five years ago i pretty much was just um you know just trying to keep it modestly interactive with people in a sense that they could you know feel like oh something new is happening here or oh something's been rearranged or this or that but but mostly it's all about content is my kind of involvement with doom boogies i always perceived it as being more a repository or a library or you know something that would just sit there but like it has and the nature of the internet these days is well you're not worth much if you just sit there you know you have to kind of be interactive with people that's at least that's what trend trends in the internet kind of how they kind of go so i've been you know struggling over the past five years well how do i make this website that has both that but it keeps the the nature of what i want it to be just kind of this place where how to match in um information and um just all the latest news and rumors and kind of rarities and all that kind of thing where i can just collect it all so people can have a single place to go for resources so you know all of that put together is kind of the what's behind doom Muggies these days um there is a new website that's not 75% ready to go. So one of these days, I'll get back into it and, <laughs> and la- launch the new Doom Buggies, you know, the 20th anniversary Doom Buggies that's ready for your mobile phone and et cetera, et cetera. Well, just doing a site, I mean, I started my site two years ago, but even so, your point about having to stay on top of it, it definitely seems that way, where if you're, when it's not your job to stay to to stay on top of the social media side and even just news and different things and yours being more focused on the haunted mansion it might seem easier but it's also kind of i think more challenging in a way because it's a very it's what you're looking at is a very specific thing so that's it's not easy yeah well you know and i've always <laughs> both with mousedalgia my the podcast i do now and doom buggies i've always kind of focused on just content really i, I you know early on like i said i, I did doom buggies to teach myself web design but i let go of that dream a decade ago you know after doom buggies was 10 years old i realized this is a it doesn't have graphic designers did need to know that early website stuff because that was part of it but then it started to split where well now graphic designers design the look and feel of the internet but they don't have to make it work someone else can program it and make it go <laughs> so i you know so so then with that change in trends i also kind of let go of needing to understand all of it so and i think part of the success of doom Muggies, even after 20 years even though it still is basically a stale tech technologically stale website but the content is not and so and the same thing with mouse style you know it's just the podcasts we do but my my most important the most important thing to me is just interesting shows something different something that people haven't heard of before you know same thing with doom muggies something just want to find the stuff that no one has read or seen before and i think as long as you bring fresh content to what you do you know it can be more or less technologically impressive but people still are really looking for 
information. That's what I'm focused on. That's totally true, because especially given how much how many Disney fans are doing blogs and podcasts and everything, the way to stand out. I mean, there's blogs I read that are the old blog spot, most basic format, but they're still like the best ones out there. And the most interesting to me, because it's not just like the news, it's something unique, especially things like the pirate pirates or the haunted mansion or something. You'll find sites that you're like, wow, they just wrote 5,000 words about the elevator or something. So those are the kind of things that I think are the most interesting. So let's talk about the haunted mansion. Cause obviously, you know, you wrote a book about it, you know, a lot of things. So I I have some questions on that front, but sure. one is this kind of general. I mean, it's been almost 50 years, you know, at 40, 48 plus years since, since it opened. How, what do you think it is about the Haunted Mansion that makes it, to me at least, seems as popular as it's ever been after this much time? Yeah, that's that's a super question. And uh, I get asked that question in a variety of ways. And my answer changes a lot because, <laughs> well, because quite simply, I, I don't know, you know, but, but to try to kind of give you some thoughts I have. Well, it appeals to so many different types of people. Oh, I mean, there's like there's p- people like me who love Imagineering and the history of Disneyland. And it has a really specific, intriguing story from that point of view. But it's also very dramatic. You know, there's not much. Well, there's a lot of drama in Disneyland, of course. That's, you know, Walt Disney was the master of storytelling. There's got to be drama and joy and all the, all the emotions are, are, you know, touched on. But the Haunted Mansion has this interesting kind of twist on kind of looking at you know traditional haunted horror type things but putting a playful twist on it which is very unique so that appeals to lots of different people you know you feel like you can like something that's a little bit you know a little bit twisted but still have an innocent it still has an innocence about it so i think that's really appealing and it's it kind of followed some trends through the past you know with the internet and then kind of a gothic community also was forming and but the internet helped that kind of gel together. Also, the music of the late 80s, you know, kind of made this community of people that also kind of fell in love with the Haunted Mansion. So that was one thing that happened also. That's And that happened in many different ways. Like lots of little groups of people have kind of taken it as a special place that they love, whether it's magicians or actors or people that follow different subcultures. So, so you know, that's why it's hard. It's been hard for me to answer this question because it's so wide it has such a wide range of appeal to so many different kinds of people that it's I think it's really a very difficult question to figure out. What, so why is it still so popular? You know, back in 1969, when it opened, it, it basically crashed Disneyland. I mean, the, the week after it opened, Disneyland had its record attendance for years. It was some 80, I don't remember exactly, 83,000 people, maybe, which when you think about it, that's that's a good busy weekend now at Disneyland. But But back in 1969, there was no... No Indiana Jones, no Space Mountain, no Big Thunder. You know, none of these big right. giant e-tickets were there. And people waited in line. I've talked to a couple people that were working at Disneyland then. And they said, and one of the guys that was working there said he remembered the lines stretching all the way down through Frontierland, almost to Main Street. People were waiting in line when the Potter Mansion first opened for four or five hours just to just to go on it. So it was definitely something cultural happening there. You know, I'm trying still to kind of put myself in that place and learn more about that and talk to people that were there. Uh, but even, you know, when I talk to people that remember waiting for the Haunted Mansion and wanting to go on it, there's not very consistent stories about the, that either. I mean, the stories about what happened are consistent, but the reasons people were so intrigued were are so different. It just was really this this big mysterious thing that was happening, and it just really appeals to a ton of people. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's the best way I can, you know, kind of answer that question. No, I think you, you know, you a lot of my questions kind of hit on some of the similar things, though, um, because there is no clear answer. I think that's almost why it's so popular in a way. It's that if it was just catering to a small segment of the population, whether it's kids, whether it's you know, roller coaster fans or, you know, I'm just throwing out various groups of gots or whatever, it wouldn't be as consistent and people would eventually grow tired of it. But the fact that it draws so many, I know that I spoke with with James, James H. Carter, who did that, the film Foolish Mortals. I spoke to him last year, but when he was working on it, which just focuses on the fans of of the that love the attraction. I'm sure there was plenty of people that would from all different walks of life that that would be in that. I haven't seen the film yet, but 
it's fascinating to think about all the different types of people it's touched. And to get to your point about opening day, too, I mean, could you imagine, I mean, this is pre-internet, too, so people don't have the background. For a building to just sit somewhere at Disney World or Disneyland somewhere for like eight years and... <laughs> No one people and they put up the sign and people kind of knew what it was. But I mean, the amount of people that I'm sure saw that building and thought, well, what what is that or what's this going to be? I mean, I couldn't imagine what that would be like even in the Internet days. But, you know, there'd be leaks and stuff. But without it, that had to be crazy. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's kind of and there was no reason for people not to think it was finished. Right. Because it looked finished. And it would be kind of like if they had built one of Star Wars lands attractions you know completely designed it and had it sitting there but you couldn't go in there and couldn't see what was going on and they didn't really say much about it right so it was uh, definitely something that everyone was talking about you know what's people you know because you you hear all the rumors and myths that were surrounding the 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 days before it opened someone died in there or was too scary so they had to go back in and change it you know or you know that kind of story right continued to circulate around for years um different variations of that story but yeah and you're you're right before the internet you know people would just talk about this you know over their over dinner and at the school ground and, and you know things like that so you know and that also probably played a little bit into why it became such a big huge uh popular thing off the bat you know all these years of intrigue couldn't have done anything but make it really a, a mis- mystery that had to be solved yeah, and if Disney obviously did not plan for it, you know, they didn't know that all the things were going to happen with, you know, Walt Disney dying and with the World's Fair and all the reasons it slowed down. But it's it's fascinating to think about how well they set that up without realizing it. <laughs> you know, it's 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 just one of those one of those things. But that seems to be a trend, I think, with the mansion. I mean, I, what I really find interesting in your book is when you talk about kind of you have a chapter called like Too Many Cooks, where you talk about you know Mark Davis and he was you know he does kind of lighter things. Things and Claude Coates, who has a scary atmosphere, and how it all kind of mixes together along with you know what you know Gracie did and, and some of Rolly Crump's ideas. Do you how important do you think that mix was to basically what how successful it is now? Yeah, well, I mean, the mix was was critical to what it is now um, because it wouldn't it wouldn't have had this uh, interesting you, you know kind of scary beginning but then it lightens up in the middle you know that that may have been different if we really let mark davis take the lead or let claude Coates take the lead so um but now if you talk to well mark davis for sure pro- i would say he didn't ever really think the haunted mansion was just what he had hoped um i think he was proud of what he did and i think you know he thought it was a good good attraction but you know i and Rolly crump too who, which who had a ton of ideas for this thing that really got poo-pooed by most of the Imagineers and Walt liked, you know, it's one of the, uh, you know, crimes of Walt passing away in the middle of this attraction was that, you know, he really wanted to use this stuff Roy Crump was coming up with. And he, he told Roy, we're going to, we're going to do this. And you can tell he, he had kind of put that plan into motion because when uh, Marty Sklar wrote this script for the sign that they put out in front of the Haunted Mansion that was there for, uh, I don't know how many years it was there. It was there for a while, though. It said, you know, we're going to have this museum of, of weird or the strange or something, something, you know, the supernatural, which is clearly what Walt had wanted to do with Rolly Crump's stuff. He told Rolly, you know, we're going to use your stuff and make this museum. And but then uh, once Walt passed away, that stuff just got pushed aside because Rolly was a young guy, you know, and he had Walt's ear. And I think the Imagineers that were more, um, you know, old school and had been around for quite a while and probably didn't think this this young guy deserved quite so much of Walt's time. And so, you know, he, he there was really a little bit of conflict in there. And um, I think, you know, I, I would have really liked to see what would have come out of that, you know. So so you have all these people with all these ideas, right? And to kind of get back to your question, you know, did it, is that, you know, kind of why the Haunted Mansion is the way it is? Yeah, you know, for sure. Do they all feel like it came out as well as we do looking back, you know, 50 years later? I don't really think think so i don't think anyone came out of that completely satisfied but it's kind of the triumph of good ideas right so we and which is kind of the case in a lot of things that happen at imagineering and with the parks you you see this triumph of good ideas once these people kind of get together and kind of hash it out you know this is what we're left with and fortunately for Haunted mansion fans you know we seem to as in general have taken this as a superior effort you know as opposed to what all the individuals might have done on their own um, it's interesting how it goes together, but I think everyone pretty much agrees it's it, it came out really successfully. 
Yeah, and I think that's that's how I feel about it. The more I think about it, as I was I was rereading your book and preparing for this, is I think it's one almost like a happy accident. Not that the mansion would have been a bad attraction. It would have been, I think, a good attraction if a lot of different things had happened. But this, it's almost like your brain can't totally because it's not so linear and so like, and then this happens and this happens, the tones are all different and you have somebody committing suicide and then there's some funny things and it's, it's all over the map. But I think that's why it's so fascinating because you go in and every time I'm like, I don't know if I noticed that that was there. That's a really weird thing. Or I didn't notice this or something. And I'm not sure that would have been the case. I mean, Mark Davis, he did like, you know, he did America Sings, which I love America Sings, but you know, he's, his, sensibility was very different but he brought something that made the mansion more fun which i think we need so i think it's funny that (laughs) it's so many so many different sides of it and i wanted to ask you mentioned the museum of the weird and i've with rolly crump and i was going to ask you obviously not obviously i was going to ask you if you thought it would have been built and you already answered my question but i'm just curious if that had been built i'm trying to picture so that's like a side museum. Would the main attraction have been the same? Or, you know, have you thought much about, like, what does the mansion look like if that part of it is in there? That's a great question. It's it's fun to kind of think about. I, I suspect Walt didn't even quite have that answered for himself. And, you know, they had, like, along with Pirates of the Caribbean, they had the Pirates Arcade. With Bear Country later on, they also built kind of a Bear Country Arcade. So I, I suspect it was kind of a you know, a tag along in, in that regard, kind of, well, there's a haunted house and then there's the museum of the weird. I don't know if Walt thought maybe we'll put some activities in here. I don't know if he thought it's just going to be purely an exhibit. You know, there was once upon a time, the Davy Crockett rifle museum, you know, they had all these <laughs> kind of things in Disneyland that were similar ideas to this. And so I, I suspect it wouldn't have so much had an impact on the mansion itself as much as more the experience of the haunted mansion because there'd be this adjunct thing you know connected to it that was wall rolly crumps crazy weird ideas you know but that could have informed the whole mythology of the haunted mansion because why would this house have this collection of stuff it would have to have had something to do with the owner of the home you know so it it would have had a whole set of other questions and answers and stories that would tie in with the haunted mansion that that never really came to be because you know you know walt had pretty much just decided yeah we're going to try to find out what to do with this stuff but then you know he before he could really make those plans he passed away so you know we, i guess we'll never know right but uh yeah it's it's fun to think about when you see all of Rolly crump's you know just mind-boggling ideas um some of them you feel like even for imagineers like how would you even make this handle <laughs> wax dripping man that comes to life and talks it, you know he had just some of the craziest weirdest ideas but i think that's what walt liked you know kind of push the the boundaries of what what can we actually show people and how can we make it work yeah so i you know but i i don't really I, I have a hard time picturing it actually i can wish i kind of knew and i like the idea of it but i yeah I, it's hard for me to imagine how that could have actually been um but i would have loved to see it it's it i agree it's tricky because roy crump was i think he was a bit more of an artist in a way like um he would create the, he had kind of a crazy artist mind which helped him when you saw attractions where he worked with people that were a little more down to earth or theatrical they all kind of came together in an interesting way but my my picture is probably in my head i probably pictured this giant walk through attraction and the real thing probably would have been like 10 percent that size i think i'm picturing some sort of like massive halloween haunted house or something which i doubt it would have been that that much yeah i mean well you know it's hard to say you look at that place now and you kind of feel like well where would this even have gone (laughs) right (laughs) um, but um yeah but i mean he certainly designed it that way i mean you see some of his concept art but but rolly crump wasn't designing for museum of the weird he was designing for the haunted mansion he thought this place can't be halloween and trick-or-treat and we can't have witches and ghosts and black cats and spider webs it has to be something really weird you know and um he was inspired by all of these you know avant-garde really kind of 
off the wall films and things he'd seen. So he was he was designing stuff for big spaces, you know, for in like for a house. So how that would have translated itself. I think he also when Walt told him, um, you know, well, I'm thinking some of this stuff could be in this this museum of the weird. Then I think he started designing towards that end. So I think some of the smaller things like, well, we'll have this wax man and those kind of things. I think he, those might have been his ideas for the museum of the weird. But some of his great grand ideas were actually he thought this is what we should do in the haunted mansion and those are the things that kind of got short shrift from the other imagineers they really didn't see it that way right because they were thinking more in terms of this is too crazy we can't put this in disneyland i I mean i would suspect that would be the case or like you said he's a young guy he's kind of the walt loves him we're going to show this guy who's boss or something you know (laughs) i I think that's probably mostly what it was i mean and also they had been you know from ken anderson on this haunted mansion had been going and going from 1956 or 57 so it wasn't like they didn't have kind of a theme and some ideas and a nice storyline and the ideas of of a ghost host taking you through a fairly traditional haunted house you know so you know it was it was i think a lot of it was his youth and kind of you know well what is what does he know but I, but some of it was also just he really was saying hey i know you've been working on this for a decade but we really got to tear this up and start over you know and i don't think ever, everyone was too fond of that idea either yeah he's a, he's an outspoken guy at least from what i've seen with interviews and his book and everything so i'm sure he probably spoke up about that and yeah if they've worked on it for that long that wouldn't that wouldn't probably sit well for almost anyone you know um i want another big thing about the mansion obviously is some of the effects especially like the pepper's ghost effects which are very old effects and what amazes me when i write it is that and i know they've made some adjustments to certain things with digital technology and such but it still seems less dated than a lot of attractions that were built five or 10 years ago. And I can't figure out why, (laughs) you know, it's like, why can't, (laughs) I mean, I know some of it is just skills and time and money and everything, but why do you think that is? What is it about the mansion and these effects that makes it stand out and seem more modern or classic than even things we're seeing that are in general? I mean, there are exceptions, but that are coming out more recently. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. And I, I mean, I suspect it's just because, you know, the Haunted Mansion puts you into a place, you're in a space, you see something that's there in front of your face and, you you know, it it may disappear or reappear. and That's kind of amazing. But at the same time, you you can tell there's something there. You know, this new trend to do everything digitally, that's what's going to look dated. Man, in 10 years, all of these digital things are going to look like atari games look to us now they're just gonna look ridiculous and and you kind of see that in the haunted mansion i mean i'm so there's a lot of people that are big fans of the the bride ghost bride effect but i personally don't find it to be quite as successful you know as some of the other things now you can say hey they've had you know projection in the haunted mansion ever since it opened which is true but but i just in general i feel like the most successful stuff in the haunted mansion is just the real things you know there's a coffin with hands pushing to get out you can see and you can tell that it's sitting there in front of you and this is happening you you know that it's hard to not for, you know, if the, if the story is good, like if the gag is good, you know, oh, man, something something is you don't often think of something trying to get out of a coffin like that. You know, if there's a, if there's a good gag there, then, you know, the simplicity of a little mechanical hand pushing up and down doesn't really register with you. But what registers with you is that thing is right next to me and it's trying to get out of this thing. And I want to get out of here before you know whatever yeah. it is comes out of there. You know, and that's that's kind of. Uh, you know, those those kind of attractions, in my opinion, are timeless. Like you said, it's just how where's the where's the 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 part of that that's going to lose lose something over time? You know what I mean? I, there's no element of that that time is going to erase. But when you do something with a you know magical digital screen, eventually there's going to be a better magical digital screen or something that looks a little bit more dimensional or, you know, so that, that kind of technology is going to be necessarily dated, but Disneyland will do, of course, do its best to update those things as technology changes. So I'm not, not really trying to say they shouldn't use the digital effects or anything, but I just feel like there, there is hardly an element of time to putting you in an environment and just telling you stories, which is a big part of the Haunted Mansion. And I think that's, kind of the timeless thing that you're talking about yeah and i think a perfect example for me is well at at disney world 
they have the hitchhiking ghost, which as a kid, we always rode and you were like, wow, which one am I going to get? This is great. And then they added the digital screens where they like take off your head and stuff. And that's kind of fun, you know, but I always felt like, oh, was that really needed? It seems kind of silly. And now they have the thing where they put your state up there and they say, oh, have fun going to Missouri because they read the magic band. And I'm like, <laughs> and my daughter laughs. So, okay, okay. But it loses something. And I know being, I, you know, I went as a kid. So a kid now is not going to say, well, it was great when there was nothing. They're like, oh, look at the fun effect. But to me, it that's kind of a, a cheap trick. I don't know. I mean, compared to what you describe where it's like your brain fills in the gaps with something like that, the hands trying to get out of the coffin. Obviously, there's nothing in that coffin, but your brain thinks there is something in there that's getting out where yeah. the digital effects are kind of like, OK, that's that's a neat trick. So to me, it doesn't work as well, but I'm fine. if the, It's not about not making changes. I just, you know, because they've made some great changes. I mean, the Hatbox Ghost, I have not seen it yet. But from what I've heard, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think they did a good job with that. Yeah, they did do a good job with that. And that's also kind of gets to what I've been saying. You know, it's it's digital effect, but it's also on a practical character and you know the digital and the practical part of that thing really and the mechanical part really work well together so it's kind of this new hybrid which is i think where attractions are going right but yeah and i agree with you about the you know the hitchhiking goats is a good example because it kind of turns it from something that i i think is supposed to still be that haunted mansion blend of kind of silly but at the same time you know, this is what, what we're telling you is, you know, you're going to be basically possessed by these ghosts that are going to, you know, that's like the idea behind hitchhiking ghosts. Right. So, you know, they're going to follow you. They're going to you're going to take these things with you. And, you know, there some of them are comical. One of them's kind of spooky looking. And, you know, when they're just kind of there silently in your in your buggy with you, it, it's just this kind of moment of where where you decide what the story is about this. Like you were saying, you fill in that story. But when they're like holding up signs and bouncing around with your head yeah. and stuff like it's not the story is gone you know it's no longer oh you're gonna maybe you know maybe there's no more ominous moment of what does this really mean it's just kind of a goofy thing that happens so yeah but i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it's haunted mansion is such a and I, it's also kind of goes back to it it's just such a, a powerful successful attraction that they tinker with it here and there and they're going to keep tinkering with it you know and yeah i i don't i don't have anything against them in in a big sense tinkering with it because you know they just want it to be the best thing it can be and i think everyone at disney has too much respect for both for what it is, for the history of it, and also for just the people that love it continually that I don't think they'll ever really ruin the thing. They might try things that are more or less successful, and I believe if they're not successful, they'll eventually change them again. And so, yeah, you know, it's interesting to see how they decide what they're going to do with, you know, what they're going to do with the future of that place. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the storytelling is for me, you know, the essence of why it, it, it really appeals over time, no matter what kind of technology is in there. Right. And just quickly on the Hitchhiking Ghost, if you really think about it, they basically the idea when you go by little Leota and everything and she says your death certificate, you could read into it the fact that those ghosts are going to come with you and kill you and bring you into the haunted <laughs> mansion. And instead, it's like, well, I mean, you could, I guess you could still say that they're saying have fun in Missouri. They're like, we know where you live and we'll follow you. <laughs> I don't know. But it, it definitely changes the setup. But I agree. That's that's the only thing I can really think of. I mean, they added at Disney World. They added, you know, the Escher steps, which is kind of a cool little effect. And they have the different attic, which does have that digital effect with the bride that you mentioned. But they've they've done some different things there. And so it's not all bad. And I feel like so the refurb they did, I think it was like 2007, at least in Florida, was like with audio and the video and some of the things they did made that place seem better so they can do really good things to the mansion and they've done generally a good job in keeping it great oh yeah i still generally tell people that i i, I think i prefer the walt disney world on a mansion mostly because of the what they did when they updated it you know especially that stretching gallery that's phenomenal now i just every every year i wish disneyland would redo their stretching gallery to to match disney worlds because the the audio and the new the new sound effects in there it's just this phenomenal it's amazing what they did there so yeah i mean you know just what you said you know it's they both have their strong points 
I agree because that's the sound in there is incredible. Now, if you could just get people to stop reciting the ghost host thing really loudly, I'd be I'd be all set there. I think that's the only <laughs> thing. I don't know if it's how it is in Disneyland from when I've been there. I'm sure but... it's I'm sure it's the same. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's you know, and it's that's one of those things where yeah, you feel that way, but at the same time, you just understand like this is a cultural touchstone for so many people, and it's such an important thing, and you know, it's a right. Or just this little ritual that people have, and you know, who am I to? As as a haunted mansion fan, you can usually find a time to get in there. You know, right when it opens, or right when it's going to close, when everyone isn't crowded in there, and you know, reciting the spiel and ruining it for you. And then I can, you know, I can let them have fun with it. But um, I mean, but it is, you know, when you're in there alone, which I've had a few few rare occasions to be in the haunted mansion with very very few people. One time, took totally alone, and it's a really loud scary place you don't you don't realize how comforting it is to know everyone is in here with me and it's you know i've done it a million times and i I know it's supposed to be funny it's actually pretty eerie when you just are alone with the words and the loud things (laughs) coming out (laughs) to try to get you everywhere you you turn um so you know there is something to wishing you could have that experience you know on a regular basis yeah and there is the nice I've never done the solo one, actually. That would be interesting. I think now at Disney World, it's never going to happen but because it's so popular. But I remember going in the mid-2000s when you would be in there with like five people and such. Yeah. And it is a different experience. But there is kind of that. It's like a horror film where you go and you're with the crowd at the movie theater and you all laugh. So there is. I don't mean to be old man shaking fist at clouds kind of thing here <laughs> with, with my thing. but uh, But it does. It is. It's fun. I mean, the whole experience is fun. And I wanted to ask you a little bit, too. Have you had a chance to visit any of the other mansions around the world? You know, I've been to the Phantom Manor in Paris. I'm just curious if you've had any experiences with any of the other ones. Um, I mean, Mystic Manor or, is kind of like it, but or Tokyo or Paris. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, I have not. So I speak only of our American haunted mansions. Um, I've talked to a zillion people, you know, uh, of course, for, for Doom Buggies, I've done lots of research on all the other haunted on mansions but i but no i haven't actually experienced them myself yet on that note you know i i've been to paris which is incredible i mean with the western theme and all that but i don't want to just make you feel jealous so i won't i won't go into that <laughs> but on that note mystic manor is this something like to me I don't believe it's really I think it has elements of the Haunted Mansion, but to me, it is not their mansion. To me, it's like a variation. But what do you think? Would you call it one of the Haunted Mansions officially? No, not at all. In fact, I've had lots of people write and say, when are you going to put a Mystic Manor section on Doom Muggies? And I just tell them never because it has nothing to do with the Haunted Mansion. (laughs) And I mean, I know Disney put out their official book and they consider it. And I guess this is an official thing now. uh, They consider it kind of a kissing cousin to the haunted mansion because it's got a chapter in the new the latest version of their haunted mansion book but i just i don't i don't see it there's no ghost story it's more like pandora's box story which is fun and i guess it has some creepy elements to it and and i also can see the homages to the haunted mansion but i don't yeah i'm not i'm not on board with calling that the their version of the haunted mansion (laughs) well that's good yeah i mean don't get me wrong if they said tomorrow we're going to put Mystic Manor in the Hollywood Studios or Disney's Animal Kingdom, I'd be like, yes, do it right now. But, (laughs) you know, I'd love to see it. I don't know when I'm going to be in Hong Kong anytime soon. To me, it's like its own thing. Like you said, it it has some nice touches that are, you know, nods to the Haunted Mansion. But I, I also read it that way. So I figured you probably would, though. I also thought you would say Disneyland was your preferred version. So I... I my assumptions are not always right. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I I just admire what they did for you know, and for you know now how we have the Hatbox Ghost now, so that kind of even the scale a little bit. We we you and we we and they whatever. You know. <laughs> I get what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, but um, but I you know I I just really I mean it starts on the right note for me, and that stretching gallery with that our oral sound of our oral experience you have you know with all the audio speakers everywhere that's just something else something amazing so no i i don't disagree and you know i i don't feel like i can even make a fair statement because i've you know i've only been to disneyland a few times only once really recently so i feel like i'd have to like when you've written one like 50 times and one like 
five times. I don't know if I can, <laughs> I can really make a clear statement, but there. Bo- I do love in Disneyland being able to like feel like you're walking in the front door, which yeah. to me they also have that in Paris. And the the interactive queue in Florida, I think, has some really cool things. But and especially with FastPass Plus and the whole setup there, it doesn't feel the same until you get inside. So I do like that better in California, that idea of just kind of walking right in, like you're really entering this kind of normal building and you have no idea what's in there, even though obviously the show building is not that building. Yeah. And you know, what's surprising to me over the years of Doom Muggies is how many people write me trying to figure out, so how did they, you know, where in that building, you know, where is that graveyard? You know, that people try to figure out how does this all fit into this place? Um, and, you know, it really does throw some people for a loop. It did for me when I was a kid in Florida. I remember being like, well, wait, do you go up or you go down? And how do you, how do you, what's the upstairs? <laughs> you know, because that's a yeah. big, that's even a big structure. So you get fooled too. But even so, it doesn't make any sense, really. But yeah. that's part of why the ride is so good, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I wanted to ask you a bit about the book itself, since um, I think the book is great. And if people are interested, I mean, you're you've it's been out for a while, but now you have a second edition, which is um, a lot recently and has a lot of good stuff in it. But um, what made you decide, you know, you had dune buggies. When did you decide, OK, I want to put all I have into a book? Let's see. You know, I think I kind of always knew this would be a good story to tell. And I had been over the past couple decades i've been interviewed for magazines and i've written a couple magazine articles about the haunted mansion and um the story was kind of becoming clearer and clearer to me and then also jason sorrell had written his book about the haunted mansion for disney and he did that um you know spending a lot of time on doombuggies.com and our message boards back when we used to have message boards and forums before facebook erased that from the face of the earth and i mean he was open about that you know hey you know i'm i'm kind of here writing this book and you know i just is interested in kind of getting the pulse of the community and and i you know i he always had told me you know this story should be this huge novel but we can't do that you know and and people buy picture books from disney so you know we have the resources to have all these amazing pictures and photographs in here but i can't really you know he couldn't really tell too much of the story and then on the other hand of that the haunted mansion story has a lot of conflict in it and disney i mean they don't try to hide that necessarily from some of their serious history books or whatnot but just for a picture book about the haunted mansion i don't know that they'd really want to go into oh yeah and a lot of the imagineers would always argue about this and that you know so so i felt like his book really needs a companion that really tells the story in depth and and i knew that i had written enough to kind of put together a backbone for that book I just needed kind of something to just start the narrative. So I went to uh, spend a day with Rolly Crump just talking about the Haunted Mansion. And so I went to his place for, I don't know, quite a few hours. And we just talked about the Haunted Mansion, (laughs) (laughs) what he could remember. And, you know, the the Museum of the Weird Stories and a lot of other stories, you know, were weaved in there. But that kind of gave me what I needed to to put together this this new book. You know, I kind of base it. I kind of go off in different directions and uh, and come back to what Rolly kind of told me, you know, as kind of a center thread through the whole thing. And um, yeah, that's basically how it came about. It was a fairly easy book to write because of Doom Buggies, like you said. You know, the publisher has been asking me to do a Pirates version for a couple of years, and I I just don't know if I can. You know, I I know a lot about the Pirates attraction, but I just, I'm not as steeped in it as I was with Doom Boogies over the past 20 years. So I'm, I'm thinking about that. But, you know, I it's this book in particular was easy to write. And I mean, the revisions just kind of also keep writing themselves. I mean, I just keep learning more and more and more about the Haunted Mansion and feel like, oh, that's got to be in the book. That's got to be in the book. You know, so I keep putting I don't know if there'll be a third edition sometime soon or not. I mean, there's there's just so much to, to tell with that story. So much to tell. Yeah. And I think you make a good point about what we talked about earlier, you couldn't really have, you know, nice pictures of the people that worked on it and then have them. And then they were really mad at Rolly Crump and they threw him out of the bus and then Walt died. And then this switched and it'd be like people, Disney people be like, well, what about the magic of Imagineering and everything? So, yeah, but I, and also I think what you do really well in the book is you'll say, okay, let me step back a bit. Remember this happened and you're able to kind of put together this narrative that it needs more time to put together. And even the way you structure it, where you talk, you kind of have the story and then going through the ride which is good because if you tried to kind of go through the ride and tell the story at the same time 
because the story is not very clear, it would be impossible. So I think that makes it a lot easier to kind of follow because I'm sure wasn't a challenge to kind of put all these because there's so many different stories and different people involved to put it all together in something cohesive. Yeah, it was. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because there's there's two schools of thought about that in re, in reaction to my book. Some people appreciate it, like you, you said, and I appreciate that. And some people just don't, you know, they, they really wish there was a straight direct narrative that I could have followed that was a little bit more, uh, a little bit less of, well, remember that this person was doing this over here. But it's very difficult to, for me as, as the kind of storyteller I am, it would have been impossible for me to figure out how to, how to do that because so many things were happening concurrently and also so many just different there were just different tracks of this person was going off and doing this for a while and this person was going off and doing this for a while and they're kind of at the same time you know so how do, how do you tell both stories simultaneously so yeah I thought the best thing to do was to try to kind of find the most interesting threads and then kind of divide them into segments and then tell one and then say, well, meanwhile, we're over here and this person's doing this. And, yeah, I, I, I think it fits together the best the best way I could tell that story, you know, and I, and I couldn't really tell you what was happening inside the Haunted Mansion itself because that all those different scenes came together. Some of them early in the late 50s, some of them right up to the mid 60s. You know, there's no real timeline for how that came together that you can, you know, really express successfully in terms of a time narrative. So that was more of a separate thing. You know, now, now let's see what they put together. After I've told you the story of how they kind of, you know, came up with their ideas, now let's see what they did. Right, yeah. cuz it's not like an attraction if an attraction was built now where people are using video and phones and documenting probably we may never see it, but they're documenting everything they're doing where it's not like in the 50s. They went, OK, we built this room. Now let's get I mean, maybe they had some early video cameras or, or film cameras, excuse me. But the odds of those being around still are very low. So yeah. I think I think you have to kind of you don't want to make assumptions because, like you said, you don't really know totally what was in that show building at what time. And also, too, I think it's. There's a, it's nice to have a little mystery, even in a book about the Haunted Mansion, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, there will always be a little mystery, mostly because you know, the people that are involved with this are, many of them have passed away and, you know, their stories have, have gone with them now. So there are holes in this story that probably will never be told, you know, and, um, but that just adds to the mystery, like you say. So, um, yeah. Well, I think it turned out really well. And I want to, before we finish, I did want to mention, you know, that you are for a long time been one of the co-hosts of the Mouse Nostalgia podcast, which focuses, you know, on Disneyland, like I mentioned. And in case any listeners aren't familiar, I'd love if you want to talk about just um, what the show is and what you guys do. Yeah, thanks for that. Mouse Nostalgia is, like you said, focuses on the West Coast, so Disneyland. We, uh, you know, I like to secretly think of it as a uh, kind of a history podcast that we fool people into listening to by telling them that it's a Disneyland trip podcast, trip tips podcast. <laughs> but um, I mean, we do a little bit of everything, right? We we just there's four of us, myself and uh, my co-hosts, Kristen, Dave, and Becky, and we all just sit around a table. Kristen is in Seattle, so she's around the virtual table, but we, Dave and Becky, and I, I literally get together every. Uh, week or two and we sit there and record a podcast and we just decide you know we all live very disney lives because we are intrigued and fans right so we always have something to talk about we started this podcast almost almost 10 years ago we kind of said well there's seven lands so there's seven weeks and then uh oh boy <laughs> you know <laughs> what are we gonna do you know and but it turns out you know there's there's no end to what you can talk about as far as disneyland and disney you know so and then d23 started right right when we started our podcast so we could also talk about everything going on with d23 and then the walt disney family museum opened out here and so we cover all of their special events and um in panel discussions and talks and things so we just yeah, there's never never enough time to talk about everything we want to talk about. So, but we primarily focus on the West Coast. So, not a lot of um, Disney World commentary. But we every year we have a Disney World show. One of us will end up in Disney World, and we you know do a trip report. And Kristen just got through with a long Asia report. She went to all the Asia parks and on a Adventures by Disney trip. So we you know we cover that stuff the best we can. But we're primarily Disneyland and um, the Imagineers out here and history that kind of thing. Yeah, I just listened a few days ago to her 
trip report about Hong Kong and then got really jealous and she just kept going on about and then we went behind the scenes and talked to this Imagineer and I was like oh my gosh this is this is yeah. too much but yeah no I think I'm jealous just because you know I would love to get out to the family museum and um, am planning to get out to Disneyland again in the next I want to get there before Star Wars opens so that it's only slightly yeah. crazy not as crazy but i think it's great that you guys are focused on california especially being out there because there there are a decent amount of good disneyland podcasts but it's definitely skewed a lot more towards there being people that um do podcasts relating to disney world so it's it's good to have people on the ground in california to kind of balance that out a little bit yeah well we try to represent the best we can yeah like i say this is a good place to do the kind of show we do because out here i can make it down to la to do special d23 events and that kind of thing and like i said the walt disney family museum every month we cover a couple things there so we just are steeped in the history you know we have lots of opportunities to cover the history of the company and walt disney himself and of the parks and um we just try to bring that to our listeners well great well if if people want to learn more about that or your book or connect with you what's a great place for them to look online yeah well mousealgia is mousealgia.com that's mouse T-A-L-G-I-A dot com. And that's where you'll hear find episodes of our podcast. You can and then of course uh, you don't want to miss doombuggies.com to learn all about the haunted mansion. So that's doombuggies.com. And my book is um, you can get it on Amazon or you can just go to doombuggies.com slash book and it'll take you right there. So those are some good ways. You can follow me on Twitter at Doombuggies Web. And I'm kind of uh, doing more and more Instagram stuff for Doom Buggies. So just search for Doom Buggies on Instagram and um, try to put some interesting, unique visuals there. So there's a couple ideas. No, that's great. I think the book is great if, if people haven't haven't caught up with it and the podcast is a lot of fun. And this has been a blast. I'm ready to go ride the Haunted Mansion right now after talking <laughs> with you. I want to I do it. So yeah, um, make it happen. Make yes. It <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks so much. This was great. You bet. Absolutely. If you'd like to keep up with all the blogs and podcasts, you can go to TomorrowSociety.com or follow me on Twitter at TomorrowSoc, Facebook or Instagram at TomorrowSociety. If you'd like to get a hold of me, you can email me, Dan at TomorrowSociety.com. And of course, if you love the show, any ratings and reviews from your podcast provider would always be super helpful and much appreciated. The music for this podcast is composed by Adam Hookie and performed by the sophisticated babies. I'm going to Disney World very soon, so stay tuned for trip reports and other fun articles on the site later this month. I hope you're all having a great 2018, and I will be talking to you again very soon.